Hello and welcome to News Click. So the bank collapses in the United States over the last fortnight have generated a lot of news. What is the mechanics behind what has happened, especially with the Silicon Valley Bank? What is the politics behind it? We sat down with Bappa Sena, our resident tech expert. He's pulled up some data on this and we're going to take a look, a close look at what really happened. Welcome to the show, uh, Bappa. So, Bapa, let's begin with the Silicon Valley Bank. Now, that's the big one. Why did you think? Why do you think it's the big one here? Out of all these news that we're getting, in fact, it's spread even to Credit Suisse, and it seems to be becoming bigger and bigger. But why is SVB the most significant one? Well, SVB is the most significant one in the U.S. Now, Credit Suisse right. is really a really big bank, and but that's in Europe. But it kind of all this came into focus with SVB, right? And I think that's where we should start talking about this. Actually, in that week, in the week of, let's say, March 10th, three banks collapsed in the US. The first one was Silvergate Bank, which was very closely tied with a lot of the crypto coins and the crypto exchanges. The Silicon Valley Bank was the second bank to collapse. And then uh, following that, I think that in, on Sunday, um, Silvergate, right. uh, no, Signature, the, the third bank to collapse was Signature. Uh, now, Silicon Valley Bank is the second largest bank collapse in U.S. history, right? So that's why it's big. Um, and um, the Signature Bank, the third bank which collapsed, that's the third largest bank collapse in U.S. history. So in a single week, there was second and the third largest bank collapses in the U.S. Uh, history happened. And that's why it's making big news and shaking the financial markets. Bank stocks are going down. There is a panic in the markets because of this, right? And so... People have started equating it with the 2008 great financial crisis where the entire banking system and the U.S. economy collapsed. So that's why it's a big deal. Um, now, in order to compare, the total assets of the Silicon Valley Bank are roughly around um, $210 billion. And the assets of, I think, the, the, third ba the third bank, which is the signature bank, that has assets of about... Uh, $100 billion or $110 billion okay. in that range. To put it in context, the largest bank failure ever in U.S. history was in 2008 during the great financial crisis when Washington Mutual uh, went down and its assets were around $310 billion. So we are really looking at fairly large scale bank collapses and, and that's why the panic. Right. How does this affect the sector's biotech tech where the Silicon Valley Bank was most active? What does it do to them? Right, so the Silicon Valley Bank, um, like the name suggests, was headquartered in Silicon Valley. Right. And it catered to a lot of these VC-funded startups. And like kind of the concentration of the VC-funded startups were in tech and in biotech, and hence the, the direct effect on those uh, customers of this bank, right? Uh, interestingly, around 50%, more than 50% of U.S. Um, uh, VC-funded uh, startups used to bank in the Silicon Valley Bank. So that's that's kind of the impact of this thing, right? The entire U.S. emerging tech, biotech scene, 50% of that was banking in Silicon Valley Bank. So this is a lot of rich people's money basically in one place. This is a lot of the VC money in one place. And actually, um, uh, now it's turning out that the VCs, a lot of the VCs actually insisted when they would give money to a company, they would insist that the company bank with Silicon Valley Bank because the VCs had over time uh, build up relations with, with the Silicon Valley Bank and would get preferential treatment from the bank, right? Okay. And there was a quid pro quo as in the VC money would be parked there and in return, the this bank would give great terms, uh, loan terms to the VCs and their uh, and the, and right. the founders of these companies, right? This bank has been around for 40 years, right? It did not go bad during the tech bust, right? In, right. in, in, the, in 2000, but it went bad now, right? Right, and we have to look at both why it went bust now, as well as how the US government has responded to this problem. They have basically said, we'll give you back all your money, don't worry. So tell us about both these things and whenever it's time to look at the data, right. we're ready. So, so let's let's first start with the, the specifics of this bank. Okay. So this bank uh, is a peculiar bank. It's not like the regular bank where common people go and deposit their money. Right. So this bank has a large amount of these uh, uh, customers. A, a big portion of the customers are, like we said, uh, the VC funds, the their 
the venture backed uh, startups and the founders of those startups right okay and uh, so one reason why it makes it peculiar is that in the us the fdic the um, which is a government agency which backs your deposits in banks so that uh, that uh, the insurance your deposits are backed up to $250,000. Right. So if you, as a common person, go to a bank and deposit up to $250,000, your deposits are safe even if the bank goes down. The federal government will take care of that. Right? Now, $250,000 covers most common people. Most common people sure. will not have that much money in a single bank. Um, that covers most of the common people. Right? But this bank, because it was not common people, it was VCs, uh, and their funded companies and their founders, the average deposit in this bank was in the order of four to five million dollars. Right? Okay. Now, in fact, now statistics have come out that ninety-three point nine percent of the deposits in this bank were above the two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit. Okay. So, okay. so that causes a that causes a problem when the bank goes down because ninety-three percent of the customers are now not going to get their all their money back. Now, um, so what happened? Now we, we start looking at why this was the first bank to get impacted. What is peculiar about this bank? So, so we start with, uh, yeah, so we start with what is called the Fed's fund rate, right? right. So the Fed, Federal Reserve in the US fixes the funds rate. So this is the base rate for the, this is kind of how they set monetary policy, right? So this is the rate at which the banks will lend, uh, the Federal Reserve will lend to the banks. Right. And this kind of forms the basis on which all other deposits and loans are made. Right. right? Now, if you look at this graph, it, this starts from around the financial crisis 2008 yeah. at, the, at the right. right. So then before, just before the financial crisis, the Fed's fund rate was close to 5%. Yes. Financial crisis happens, the U.S. banking sector more or less collapses, and the Fed at that time to save the banking sector brings down, brings down that rate to 0%. Okay. Now, even though the financial crisis gets over by, let's say, 2009, max 2010, it keeps the rates to 0% all the way to 2016. Okay. In 2016, they, they make this effort to kind of normal, because the 0% rate is not a normal rate, right? Absolutely. So, so they try to, they make an attempt to increase the rate. They go to about 2% and then it starts falling. It impacts the economy. And even before the pandemic hits in 2020, which is this gray bar, mm -hmm. they start decreasing the rates. When the pandemic hits, they move it back to zero. Okay. And it stays zero till 2022, right? Now, in 2022, at, like from March of 2022 to now, which is in less than a year, they hike the rates from zero to again close to four and a half percent. Yeah, we are back to uh, back, somewhere around 2007, eight. Eight, right now this, but this this kind of sharp rise in rates is unprecedented in U.S. history, and this is kind of the reason why all these problems are happening. So, uh, see what when when you have interest rates very low you are effectively pumping money into the economy, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to stimulate economic activity by pumping money into the economy. And that money goes into all kinds of investments, right? So that money in the US fueled a lot of the tech bubble. It fueled the crypto bubble, right? So it, it fueled all these VC companies to make lots of investments into lots of these tech startups. And that money was like banked in the Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. So when the going was good in this time period, when the tech bubble was at, at its peak, uh, tech valuations were sh shooting up, a lot of VC companies were getting funded, this uh, Silicon Valley Bank got huge amount of inflows of deposits. Now, what did they do with those deposits? It's not, unlike in the 2008 financial crisis when the banks were making all kinds of shady loans and they were doing this junk bonds and what are, subprime mortgages. Right. The, these, these guys were not doing any of that high-risk thing. Okay. They took that huge amount of deposits that were coming in from these bc backed tech companies and put it into what they thought was the safest of all investments, which is in the treasury bonds and in the federal agency-backed, what are called mortgage-backed securities, which are backed by the federal government. So they put their money in what they thought was the safest, okay. right? However, once this interest rates very sharply rose, it did a two-fold double whammy to this bank. What it did was 
the money supply in the whole economy was contrasting. Squeezed, right. So that a lot of this tech company, the tech bubble kind of, the first the crypto bubble burst. Right. We saw like a lot of these crypto companies going bust and even Bitcoin, the, the elite crypto co coins, their market caps falling. And then you that followed with the tech bust, right? You saw the valuations of a lot of the big tech companies collapse. And the startup, the, the funding to the startup market kind of froze. Mm -hmm. Now, so so the starters were not getting any new funding, but the startups have these huge. The, the startups operate on this thing that they get a they get some money and then they kind of use up the money very rapidly, right? right? And and they are basically in the first few years they're all loss making, so they just use up the funding they get. So the startups were effectively not putting any more deposits while they were withdrawing the money over the last one year to fuel to run their activities right the normal business activities from the bank's perspective what was happening was their deposit intake had in, immediately gone to zero Absolutely. and had gone negative right. so this bank was starting to lose deposits for the last one year right okay so so they're rapidly losing deposits the and, other the, and, and the, that's because of this mismatch between no, the, well we'll come to that that's because the, because the Fed had increased the interest rates, money supply in the whole economy was contracting, and the VC funded companies, the, the, the most speculative plays were the first to get affected. And so, right. so the, the VCs would not fund these spe highly speculative plays. Fine. And as a result, these companies, which are now not getting any more funding, they are just withdrawing money to run their operations. So the bank is losing deposits. The double whammy comes that the this investment they had done in what they thought was the safest of deposits the treasury bonds and the mortgage back the 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 federal government mortgage backed securities there because the yield is going up now the yield and the price of a bond are inversely correlated so if the yield goes up the bond's price comes down right, right? so the all these bonds their price was coming down okay, okay? so the so and they had 91 billion dollars of these bonds they had bought Okay, now because of this rise in interest rates, the mar the market value of these bonds had fallen by fifteen billion dollars, which would wipe out their in the equity of the bank. The bank, if you recognize that loss, the bank would become bankrupt instantaneously. Right. Now there is a quirk in the U.S. banking system where the banks can choose to categorize some assets as mark to market so mm -hmm. that their prices changes every day with the market fluctuations and they can hold some assets as held to maturity okay. where where they will be valued at their coupon value at the, at the par value All right. right now so the bank svv was holding these treasury bonds at held to maturity right so they were not recognizing the loss which was happening over the over the last one year Okay, so is that sort of like presuming that whenever they mature, we're going to get what we expect? Yeah, because they're they are, they're backed by the federal government. You will get the, that money is not going to go bankrupt, right? Mm -hmm. You you will get those that money back, provided you hold to the maturity of that bond, Got right? It. Now those bonds have maturity, let's say of whatever five, ten, like they they are long term maturity bonds. Um, but because the investors were taking out money, they needed to sell those bonds to to be able to fund the investor withdrawals. Okay. And so when they started, and then I think um, at the beginning of March, they announced that they, out of the $91 billion, they sold $21 billion of worth of bonds and recognized a loss of $1.8 billion. Mm -hmm. and, and then they basically said that in order to cover that loss, they are going to issue new shares and get back $2.25 billion. That, the announcement they made. Now, one, the moment they made this announcement, like in, like panic ensured in that entire VC industry, some of the leading VCs, right? The rumor is that Peter Thiel, who is like this multi-billionaire who runs this founders fund and there are a huge number of companies. And this is kind of the most of the, the, the most elite VCs. They effectively instructed their companies to withdraw money. Okay. And once this became like the street, this gossip went on the street that Peter Thiel is asking his companies to withdraw money. All the VC companies followed. Right. And then on that single day of March 9th, $42 billion were withdrawn from the bank. And the bank instantly ran out of cash, right? And so at that point, the bank was not solvent, right? And so the, the Federal Reserve had to step in. On Friday, they stepped in and they said that they're taking over the bank, which meant that the 
the the shareholders and the people who invested in the bonds of the uh, company, uh, they instantaneously were wiped out, right? Once okay. the FDIC takes over, right. they instantaneously get wiped out. And then the question was, will the depositors get all their money back? Because like I said, 93, 94% of the depositors were above the limit of $250,000, yeah, which these is- These are not ordinary people who deposited their money this in this is not bank. Huh. But, so, so then, then, we, then we come to the, the next part, which is like the, 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 the bail, bailouts, right? Um, and so then there was a, this was causing a panic and this panic was spreading across the banking sector, right? Like stocks across the banking sector were going down. Other banks, like the First Republic Bank, they came under these bank runs. And so the Federal Reserve at that, the, the, the Federal Government and the Federal Reserve at that point said that we are going to uh, ensure everybody's deposit, not just so the, see before this the 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 kind of the uh, the law is that up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of deposits are going to be right secured. But now the Federal Reserve comes in in order to stop this bank run and the sp spreading panic. They said that we are going to take over these two banks, uh, Sil uh, Silicon Valley and Signature, but we are going to go one more step and we are going to uh, basically ensure that everybody's deposits are secure. So all these VCs, VC Papa, funds. Is this, is this why people are making comparisons with the uh, global financial crisis of 2008? Because it sounds very similar to what the government did then. Uh, all the banks made a lot of money. The clock profits, the top bankers were sort of living it up and it was very upsetting. And that's also led to this whole outcry that there's so much inequality in the United States and why are you helping the rich and why aren't you helping those who actually couldn't pay their mortgages, for example? Right. So um, that is why the Biden administration has been very careful to say that this is not a bailout, right? Well, but is it? <laughs> so, so, okay. So now there is one difference uh, between the bailouts which happened in 2008 and now, okay. which is that um, in 2008, and uh, not only were the institutions bailed out, but the peop the the kind of the shareholders, the management, okay. the people who bought the bonds for those institutions, they it, they also were protected, right? So so no management was ever um, uh, removed or convicted for fraud, or they weren't even uh, even the shareholders and the investors not did not take any cut. Now what has happened is they have removed the management. Mm -hmm. They have. Made sure they are saying that the shareholders will get zero, mm -hmm. and the people who are investing in who were investors in this uh, bank, they will all get wiped out. So in that sense, it is not comparable to two thousand eight. Okay. But to say that this is not a bailout is not correct, right? Right. So basically, what the Fed and the Treasury did following this was they they announced really two things which require funds, right? One is that they made this announcement that uh, for these two banks, Signature and Silicon Valley Bank, the shareholder, uh, the, the depositors will be made whole. And both these banks, more than 90% of their depositors are above the 250,000 limit. Right. So the majority of the people who were normally not going to get covered are now going to get covered, right? And the Fed, the, the, the FDIC, which is the agency responsible for making sure that the bank deposits goes to the people who have put their money, they have taken a loan of $142 billion in order to do this. Now, you can argue that once they dismantle the banks, they sell their assets, some of this will be recovered. Okay. But as of now, $142 billion has been taken by the FDIC to uh, pay to the depositors. Mm -hmm. Right, and th that's only one part of and it. And these are wealthy depositors. These are wealthy depositors. These are people. So people below two hundred fifty thousand dollars are automatically covered because they were covered under Absolutely. the previous regime. Right. It is this new, this one hundred forty-two billion dollars of the new uh, is the new money which has been pumped in right. to to help the people above two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Right. That's a one part of the program. The second part of the program is they have made a blanket uh, announcement that any bank can now, uh, so the banks can, see there is already, a, so the reason for the Federal Reserve to exist is that the banks, in order to get their funds, they can go to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And the Federal Reserve lends 
to the banks at this Fed's fund rate, right? right? So any bank can go to the Federal Reserve, pledge its what are called high-quality assets, which are typically treasury bonds, and get money mm -hmm. in loan. And the, the rate that they pay is the, the, federal, the Fed's fund rate. Right. right. But they said in addition to that, um, the banks can now go to the Federal Reserve, take a loan against treasury bonds or uh, like uh, these top top tier assets, but they are going to value the assets not at the market value, which was the previous regime, but at the par value, which is specifically okay. to cover for this kind of activity okay. by the Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. And just in the last um, one week, it is estimated that more than $160 billion have been loaned to the banks between this new program and the, uh, the, the traditional discount window route. Right. So in that one week, if you add these two figures, already $300 billion, $300 billion has been pumped in. Now, you, you may call it whatever term it is, but it is really Which a... Is what you just said, it's the size of the bank, the biggest bank that collapsed in 2008 huh. was about $300 yeah. billion. Dollars. Yeah, but, uh, but the Federal Reserve has pumped in $300 billion just in the last one week in order to one, protect these two banks, but or the depositors of these two banks, but also to provide a pretty much open-ended uh, window to all banks across the US to withdraw money at a preferential, uh, because, because the collateral they are putting it is not going to be valued at its market value, right. but it's going to be valued at its par value, right? And the market value is lower than the par value. Par so value. this is a preferential. So, so it is a bailout for the banks yet again, even though they're trying very hard to project it, not as a bailout. So, so Bapa, does this explain why the other banks struggle? Does this explain what's happening in Europe with Credit Suisse? Is there going to be a growing mistrust of the banking system? Uh, what's going to happen next? Right. So, um, see, the thing is that while we said Silicon Valley Bank was peculiar, and the three banks which have failed, all of them, the other two were crypto banks, Silicon Valley was a tech primarily catering to this VC-funded tech companies. So these are peculiar banks. Right. And, and they got hit primarily from their depositors who are not regular depositors, who are businesses and the businesses were withdrawing cash and not depositing new cash. Um, however, the, there is an underlying problem which is going to affect the entire banking system. Not, these are the, just the, the tip of the iceberg, so okay. to speak. So these, because they are peculiar in their clientele, they got exposed the first. But there is an underlying problem which is going to which is a problem that is there. Should so, we so, take a look at it? Yeah, so, so let's, take the, let's take this, right? So this is the total Federal Reserve assets starting from, let's say, just before the financial crisis to today, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how the Federal Reserve holds assets, that's a technical matter, but mind, the difference yes. is, the, the, the interesting point is the relative difference between the assets, right? So if you start off in 2007, before the crisis, you started off with one trillion, th these numbers are in trillions of dollars. So you started off with one trillion dollars of Federal Reserve assets. Now, when the assets increase, the Federal Reserve is essentially printing money and pumping it into the economy. So what happens with the initial financial crisis is they print about a trillion dollars and that trillion dollars is used to bail out the banks, mm -hmm. right? So the crisis gets over, let's say 2009, by 2009, the crisis gets over, but you will see that the, assets continue to increase and the assets continue to increase way into 2014 okay so what is effectively happening is the federal reserve is continuing to print money and pumping it into the economy now uh, this is because the economy is really shaky at that point in time and the federal reserve is trying to somehow stabilize the economy but what is ending up happening is this is really free money which is going to the banks and it is going to the rich, the 1%, to do all kinds of speculative investments. So investments in tech companies, all kinds of speculative investments okay. are happening. But the people as a whole, they, the, the unemployment rate pretty much remains steady, right? right? It does not decrease. And that, and there's a huge rise in income inequality. Mm -hmm. and, and that causes huge resentment against the banks, against the Federal Reserve, against the federal government in the US, where people are realizing that these policies are specifically targeted to help the rich, 
while the poor continue to suffer, right? Also under aging inflation because you keep pumping in money. Yeah, no, so, so this goes on till about 2017, 18. Mm -hmm. They make an attempt to cut it down. But even before the pandemic, they kind of reverse that. And in okay. the pandemic, they just go crazy, right? So they pumped in about three and a half billion dollars from one uh, trillion dollars, from one trillion to four and a half trillion. So about uh, three and a half trillion dollars they pump in in about 10 years or 12 years from 2008 to 2020. Come 2020, they pump in five trillion dollars. Sorry, how do we go back? They pump in $5 trillion, right? So from four to nine trillion, right. they pump in $5 trillion in a matter of like one year. Mm -hmm. So it is this huge money printing that causes this raging inflation, right? So US starts, US and the entire Western world starts seeing um, inflation at about like, depending on the country, between eight to 10% inflation, which they are not accustomed to. Initially, the inflation isn't good, but very soon the inflation moves to wages, right? As long as it was, in, interestingly, as long as it was in goods, they kept on saying that this is transitory. That's the word they use. They're transitory because there is COVID, because the supply chains are- um, uh, Disrupted right now. Are, are disrupted in China uh, and all of that. And so they were saying they're transitory. When the inflation moves to wages, that's when they started panicking. And that's when they say, oh, this is not transitory. This is going to be entrenched. And then around the beginning of 2020, Two, they started both increasing the interest rates very sharply, and then they started. This is this is the opposite of money printing. Mm -hmm. This is they're withdrawing money from the. This is called quantitative tightening. They're effectively withdrawing, sucking money out of the economy. Right. Now, once you do that, initially the most speculative businesses, the most speculative entities, they suffer, right? Because they are most dependent on this easy money, but. Uh, as we will see, this is very soon going to lead to a much more broader thing which affects everybody. What this sharp, in, what, what this like 5% increase in interest rates in the last one year and the quantitative tightening is doing is, is leading to something structural which is affecting the entire economy and not just the most speculative aspects of the economy, right? Okay, so this is the most important part of actually what's happening. This is happening. how it is transmitting to the economy, right? right? So this these curves are called yield curves, right? Okay. Now, the curve in the blue, that is the yield curve at the beginning of 2022, right? So this is January, this is in the US okay. uh, style dates. So this is January 3rd, 2022. The yield curve is the one in the blue. Mm -hmm. The yield curve today is the one in the red. Okay. Okay. So what is the yield curve? The, so if you look at the x-axis, the yield curve is w the federal funds rate, the rate of... At which the... At the which the US lends out for different durations, right? So at the... The, the smallest duration is one month, the largest duration is 30 years. Okay. Right, now, uh, now what you will notice is, the, in, this is a normal looking yield curve, where sm the, the lower duration of a loan you take, the smaller the interest rates. As right. you increase the duration of your loan, the interest rates go up. Now, this is how actually all banking activity gets funded. So banks get deposits from common people. Right. And you are typically doing a, six month deposit, one year deposit, two year deposit, and then they lend it out on the long term, right? They lend out, they do a five year mortgage, a 10 year mortgage, a 20 year mortgage on a home. Right. And the difference between let's say 10 year and one year, that is the profit of the bank. Right. Right. So that's how banks make money. That, that's the standard, <laughs> basic, right? Yes. This basic thing. What has happened now, because the Fed increased the interest rates very dramatically, the yield curve has what is called inverted. All right. So now what you see is that the short end, right? The when you are doing short term loans, mm -hmm. the short term interest rates are at four and a half percent, but in the long term, right, ten years, it is like three and a half percent, right? Okay. So now what has happened is if a bank does the normal thing, which is it takes deposits in the short term and lends out in the long term, it's actually losing money. That's right, it's so clear, yes. Yeah, so so it, it's going to actually make negative 1%, and, and at the scale, if you're loaning out billions of dollars, that quickly turns into very big losses. And this tells us why SVB... Yeah, so so be, now the bank, obviously the bank is not going to make a loss right. on a loan it will give. So what does it do? What the banks were doing was, they were artificially holding down, they were not passing the 
increase in the interest rate which the Fed has done, they were artificially holding down the deposit rates to near 0%. Okay. So the banks were trying to hold the interest rates down at 0% by loaning at let's say 3.5%, which worked for a while till people figured out that why should I put my money in the bank when right. I put it in a safer instrument, the treasury bonds are safer than any bank, Right. and I can get 4.5% when I'm getting 0% in my banking account. Mm -hmm. Right. If I do a FD in the bank, I will get 0%. If I go to uh, buy a bond from treasury, I will get 400%. So I will, what will I no, no, normally do? I will normally start withdrawing money. Sure. And so the banks are now facing, across the board, people who are moving out of bank FDs and moving to the treasury bonds. And that is a systemic problem, right? Because if this persists for too long, then first of all, the banks are not going to make any new loans mm -hmm. because of this mismatch. And you are, have, you are facing with people taking their money out of the bank deposits. And this is ordinary people. It's not just now. We're not just talking about wealthy people. So see, the, the wealthy people, they are being financially more sophisticated. They are going to do it first. Mm, okay. But eventually, everybody will figure this out. And, and that's where we come to the... Already, already we are seeing... What we are seeing here is that... See, the, this is the, the banks have unrealized gains or losses, right? So because if not everything, like we said, is held, is marked to market, right. you can hold it to maturity. The banks have these gains or losses, unrealized gains or losses. So in the last one year, we are seeing the unrealized gains like going exponentially down, right? So now what it estimated is currently the banks are, the, the FDIC has said the banks are currently sitting at $620 billion of unrealized losses. Now, that is huge. Now, if everybody was to realize the unrealized losses, the US banking system will get wiped out, right? Now, obviously, everybody doesn't have to. The well-capitalized banks, they can afford to hold on and they can afford to meet their depositor requests and not have to sell their, their, right. uh, their assets. But if they were to sell their assets, it would be a big problem. So what you are now starting to see is not just SVB, Signature and uh, Silvergate, which were kind of at the forefront do lending to the most speculative businesses, but now banks which are more broadly diversified, right? Like Credit Suisse. Mm -hmm. Now it is moving to those kinds of banks. So the weaker banks is are going to get affected because they will be forced to sell their bonds and their bonds are now setting in huge losses. So if they sell, they go insolvent. So that's what you are seeing. That's what you are seeing a bank run not just in the US, but it's now also moving to Europe. Seems definitely to be spreading. Yeah, so, so, so that's a global problem now you're seeing. And the, the root cause of the problem is the very high federal funds rate, right? Now the Fed is stuck, right? Because if it's in response to it, the way to fix it is you lower the Fed's fund rate. Right. But you have raging inflation. So if you lower the Fed's fund rate, you are going to blow up the inflation thing even more. So in the context of the United States, this is what is their classical problem, right? They can't fix both the problems at the same time. Yeah, you can't. You you can't, right? If you have inflation, then, then right. Then, but this is not a technical thing. Also, this is uh, this this is effectively a class war, right? Now, when you raise the interest rates, you are going to cool economic activity. People are going to lose jobs. Sure. Right. So when Jay Powell, the the chairman of the Fed, went to the Senate, he was asked, "Look, in the last one year, you raised Fed fund rate by five percent, and." the unemployment rate moved from 3.5% to 4.5%. So 1% increase in unemployment rate, which roughly translates to a million people losing their jobs. And he shrugged and said, this is normal, right? This is how it works. In fact, the Fed has long insisted that the natural rate of unemployment in the US is 4.5%. What is natural? There's nothing natural about it. It's basically what you're saying. It's the rate of unemployment that is required so that the people don't start asking for bargaining for higher wages. All right. Right. And, and so that is the politics. But the moment a bank goes down, rich people get affected. You see the Fed completely throw away all those principles and pump in billions of dollars. Billions, literally, right. overnight. Yeah. So, so, there is, so even though it is couched in all this technical language, actually what, you're, what it is is class war, right? Where the one person have to be preserved, protected, whether it was a 2008 financial crisis or pretty much for the last 12 years, or even before that. That's the mandate of the Fed. But the moment we, people start asking for more wages and they start getting more wages because the-, the In response to inflation. In re response to inflation, in response to the, the, the demand of labor, right? right. The unemployment rate goes down, the demand of labor increases. So at that point, uh, you see the Fed 
acting very decisively to not make that happen. Right, Papa. Thanks a lot for joining us with that very illuminating conversation. Thanks again. Thanks.